Hello. I'm quite happy to be here to tell you a little bit about the work that we've been doing. So I'm an engineer primarily, and all of my work is focused on helping people see the world in a new light. By that, I mean developing technologies to help us peer into the world in a way we haven't been able to before. And before I show you some of the examples of this, I wanted to talk about why. Why use technology in exploration? I think it's pretty obvious to most, but to me, some of the big reasons for this are in an age of really unlimited media supply. We have Facebook, we have all the media outlet channels, we have endless content to photographs on the internet. People are spending less and less time looking at these things. What might have been an amazing photograph, for example, National Geographic magazine, 30 or 40 years ago that people would show their friends and get excited about, now people are cranking through these images on their iPads almost instantly, and there's not a lot of time for the image, no matter how powerful it is, to really impact them and make them want to make a difference and be concerned about the subject of the picture. So what I feel is that we really need to show people the world in a different light, show them to it in a new format, something that they can engage with, get excited about, and maybe spend enough time with it to actually care a little bit. So one of the other reasons for using technology for exploration is a lot of these places and animal species, uh, we really are at a tipping point. A lot of these things that are beautiful and important to us right now are going to cease to exist in our lifetime or our children's lifetimes. Whether it's archaeological sites being destroyed or looted, or whether it's animals going extinct while we watch. Although the mission of National Geographic in, in large part is conservation, it's impossible to save all these things. There's been too much damage done in the past. So as people that develop technologies, I believe that we have a responsibility to record these things the best we can so that maybe people in future generations can continue to learn from our mistakes and maybe make better choices. Another point is that technology can stand where we can't. It can stand as an ever vigilant partner watching the things that we can't see. From camera systems that go down to the bottom of the ocean and record new species where we can't be, to systems that can watch over large areas of land, look for poachers, look for things like that. Can you imagine, for example, developing a technology whereby you could see live on the, inter on the internet maybe the one of the last lions being poached and the anger and the you know, furious people that would cause that maybe help see something and change it? So technology can be our partner in, in watching these things and observing these things. And the other big point for why now is we've recently arrived in a completely new era of technology. The, the quiet revolution of cell phones and tablets and these sort of technologies have really changed the game. These days, because of cell phone technology, I can buy a computer the size of my little finger that is about as powerful as a laptop computer and that we use in all of these systems. And because of tablet technology, the way you can move your iPad around and see the pan, pan and tilt because of the gyros and the accelerometers in there, 20 years ago, that would have been a technology that you would have needed top secret security clearance and would have only been able to get from a place like Boeing or Lockheed for several hundred thousand dollars. So it really is a time that's come together that means that we can create technologies for conservation and for exploration that doesn't take a department at MIT or a Bell Labs or something to create this, but really just a small team of dedicated engineers that are sensitive to these problems and really want to try to help out. So this is a small list of the few of the projects we've been working on lately, and I'm going to show you a little bit about each of them. But the whole point here is to see the world in a different way, whether it's to be able to peer into the darkness with color night vision or whether it's to be able to image things in 3D so we can create models of them that you can hold in your hand so people that can't be to an archaeological site, for example, or people that we don't want there to uh, damage the sites can actually create models for lab studies. And I'll show you a little bit of each of these. So when we started working on color night vision, one of the areas that we thought we would try was with image fusion. And what I mean by that is that we would take several cameras, thermal cameras, night vision cameras, high ISO cameras, fancy thing called, th things called enhanced CCD imagers, all sorts of different camera systems, and synthesize these what are really black and white images and false color them and create a false color image. But as we got into the project, we decided there's another way to do this, and that's basically the amplification of available light. So at night, when there's moonlight and when there's starlight, there's still the red, green, blue light that makes up uh, color. That's because the moonlight's really just reflected sunlight, and starlight has spectral similarities to our own sun, so that data is there. So what we did is, this is just a simplified version, uh, schematic of what we sort of did. You've got the red, green, and blue light coming in on the left, and then we filter that down so we're only getting red, green, or blue. And through a fairly complex series of lenses, we focus it into conventional night vision tubes, the one that gives you the green image, usually. And we take that and focus it into three cameras. We don't really use Canon cameras, but uh, we use some advanced machine imaging cameras. 
But we focus it into those three cameras and get those three green night vision images, but then we color balance it and we reproduce a true red, green, blue image. In this way, creating what we believe is the first true color night vision system in the world. So this is our prototype system. Um, and you'll note the first bullet says the prototype was completed June uh, 2012. In reality, the Saturday before I got on the flight, we were shooting video of it in my backyard. So uh, <laughs> I was asked to give a couple adjectives in a TV interview uh, a couple days ago to describe, describe our work. And uh, I used innovative, which is kind of a gimme, I guess. But the, uh, the other one I used at that moment was sleep deprived. So. Uh, <laughs> At any rate, um, these three systems, these three lenses can all capture uh, the light and amplify it. And it's basically resulted in a system that can run at greater than HD resolution, greater than 1080p, can take videos and stills at about up to seven megapixels, and also as a side effect can do 3D night vision uh, video. So we're working really hard on this system and we're hoping that this first field deployment is going to be lions hunting in the Serengeti with one of the great National Geographic photographers, Nick Nichols. And the, uh, the, the challenge there is that these lions have learned that in full moons, when it's bright enough to sort of use a traditional camera, um, they've learned that their prey can see them and that they're not as efficient hunters. So they basically lay low during these high intense moonlight periods and hunt and prefer in starlight or a quarter moon or just a little bit of moonlight. So we hope for the first time ever, we'll be able to actually capture these animals hunting in their natural environment um, without having to use light, bright lights and disturb them or anything like that uh, in, the, in the Serengeti. So I have a brief video that I'll show you a little bit about it here. Um, I was going to bring the system and demonstrate it, but I thought that might be a little hard. So I just took a, uh, an image of the, of the system, uh, some video of the system for you to see. So this is just an image in the machine shop uh, I have in Colorado. And the top picture is from the GoPro camera. The bottom is with the color night vision. And of course, it's light in there right now. The lights are on, so you can see the image in both of them. But you can see the color image in the, in the color night vision picture. It's fairly low res right now. We're working on some new night vision tubes. But I'm going to go off the camera here and turn the lights off. And when I come back, you'll see the GoPro goes completely dark. But we still have color in the lab, so we can still actually reproduce color images. So we've got a lot of work left to do. But hopefully, the next time we're showing you these pictures, it's lions hunting in the Serengeti. Thank you. I also just wanted to give a little shout out to uh, Eric Birkenpass and Mike Shepard from the Rowan Imaging Lab here. If it wasn't for their help on the 3D color, on the color night vision stuff, I'd probably still be in my yard and would have refused to have gotten on the plane. So thanks, guys. Um, the other technology that we work on is a gigapixel spherical imager. And that is kind of a mouthful. But uh, at any rate, it's basically just a custom robotic camera system that can control a camera completely. It can pan and tilt the camera around. But it can also fire the camera and change, its, uh, change all of its parameters, shutter speed and focus. And um, it's sort of like if you're familiar with the technology, the Gigapan system, um, only better, I like to say. But um, what it can do that's different is it'll interface with any can camera, any Nikon or Canon SLR camera, but also large format Hasselblad cameras, thermal, UV, uh, or multiple cameras at the same time. We sometimes use the system with a camera, a regular Canon camera, and a thermal imager on top and scan an area to produce a 360 degree image in both thermal and visual simultaneously. But um, it has ridiculous resolution. Now, we've never done this because we didn't want to stitch the images together. But um, out of the box, we could break the world record for the highest resolution image ever shot by over 100 times. Um, the really cool thing uh, that I'll show you in a minute, too, is it works underwater. So we've built an underwater housing so we can take this to some of those underwater environments where there's make, we're making archaeological finds. And we can use this camera to capture these places. So. Um, it's, it's a pretty cool system. It's completely customizable since we wrote all the software for it. One of my favorite things is I take a lot of pictures on high mountains, and we wrote a people remover in it. So we actually have the computer analyze each image and say, is there a person in the image? If yes, it remembers where they were and pans back to that spot later to shoot that spot with no people in it. So on a, on a fun twist to that, I want to add a pika adder to it at some point. We have these little animals in Colorado on the high mountains called pikas. They're like little hamsters, and they're adorable. And there's three or four of them on every mountaintop. Um, but I figure if you have the camera looking for them, you can leave it in one spot. And when the pika runs there, take his picture. Pan to the next picture. When the pika runs there, get his picture. So when we stitch it together, it would look like we had a few thousand pikas on top of the mountain. But this is, this is what engineers do when they, when they, when they dream, I guess. But, so. <laughs> So uh, one of the cool things is it's about displaying this stuff, too. The resultant imagery that we shoot from here works on the iPad with no apps or plugins. 
So uh, this is the system and it's underwater skin. Uh, we were at Oyo Negro, uh, Cenote in Mexico, where some human archeological remains were found. And these are not, not Mayan remains, but much, much older. And um, the system on the left is there in its underwater housing. You can see the little yellow tube has the computer, motor, drivers, batteries in there. The, uh, the dive team working with us took to calling the, uh, the yellow tube, which I called the spherical gigapixel underwater imaging controller. They started calling it the yellow submarine and that kind of stuff. So uh, um, the rest of it is the motor housings that control the motors that pan and tilt the camera and then the camera in an underwater housing. And what's really cool is we come up from this dive and some of the people in the picture there weren't divers and weren't down on the trip, but we come out of the cave with these images on the camera plug it in and very quickly, uh, almost instantaneously, stitch together the images so we can grab the iPad or the computer and show the people that weren't down there but are the archaeologists or anthropologists on the surface, we can show them exactly what we saw. So this is a brief video of the thing doing its job underwater. And uh, for whatever reason, it works better when it's cut to funky techno music. But um, <laughs> the light on it is pointing where the camera is taking the pictures. So it's turning around, taking a picture, turning around, taking a picture. And this is right on the edge of the big drop off 130 feet deep um, where the remains were found and the other archaeological finds were. So we're testing it out on the lip about 40 or 50 feet deep here before we go down. So you can see the system do its, do its dance. So like I said, one of the critical things is not just taking the images. Um, you know, there's value, a lot of value in the images to scientists and to researchers. But the other thing is being able to show people this is, a, is an important perspective of what I do, aspect of what I do. And to do that, we figured one of the best ways to do this is on the iPad. So we wrote a viewer, both an app and a plug-in free app that just runs off of the web so you don't need to download anything, that actually takes these images taken from this robotic camera and allows you to pan and tilt and move around on the iPad as if you were the camera. So you can look where the camera was looking and look around as you will. And um, it, it works on the digital edition of the National Geographic magazines, so hopefully you'll be seeing some of that there in the future. But one of the cool things we've done lately is developed an app, uh, an app builder, that we can go out and shoot seven or 10 or 15 of these images and create an app in situ, like on the plane on the way back from the expedition. So we can have, for example, an app that shows the you know, cenotes of Mexico, or we could do a Seven Wonders of the World app and have it, uh, have it pushed live before we even got off the plane. So pretty cool and another way to help get this stuff out to people so, uh, so they can see what we see. This is a quick example. You've got to imagine you're moving the iPad around, but this is in King Tut's tomb in Egypt. And uh, it's actually, this is screen recorded off of a computer, so it looks a little jerky. But if you see this on the iPad, it's unreal. If you turn the lights off and move around, it's really like you're there. If you walk forward too much, it can get uncomfortable. But. So you can actually see, we can zoom in. This is King Tut uh, himself here. You zoom in until you can see the mold on the walls and the, the individual pigment and the hieroglyphics. So uh, another area that we work in is in 3D scanning. And there's a lot of 3D scanning out there. In fact, using laser 3D scanning to um, analyze parts built, for example, in auto industries for quality and for size is done a lot. But what we've done is built a system that can do 3D laser scanning in situ. And the idea is we can take this system, even underwater, where we, can find, where we find skulls or other, uh, other remains that it's dangerous to remove from the area because you don't want them to fall apart, and we can scan them in situ. So this is an example just in the lab where on the left we're scanning the laser across there and mathematically from the curvature of the laser line as it moves through the 3D surface, we regenerate a point cloud. From that point cloud we generate a mesh which you're seeing in the second to last image there. And it's really hard to see in the picture but there's a little line across one of the teeth. In this mesh it's a true 3D model so we can measure things like a tooth and then we measure the real world object to show it's the same size. But the idea is we can build 3D models that can even be 3D printed and the researcher can set this skull that still sits down deep in the water on his desk or a copy of it and make all the measurements of the morphology of the skull for research. And it's sort of an outgrowth of this. Uh, another thing that we're working on is a 3D scanning camera trap. And a camera trap is a piece of technology that senses when an animal walks in front of it and then it takes a photograph or video. So we took this sort of to the next level and when an animal walks in front of our camera trap, we build a 3D model of it. So this technology um, uses infrared points uh, projected out from it and it can measure the sizes of all these infrared points and it can develop a full 3D model at 30 frames per second as an animal walks past. And the cool part about this is this is actually just a hacked Microsoft Connect. So for $100 of hardware, we've built a camera scanner. And um, the uh, last little video I have here is just showing some of the results. 
My, uh, my cat was my uh, first victim of my, of my scan and camera trap. This, this poor cat appears in more demos than you can imagine. But uh, at any rate, um, you can see it, it scanned a 3D world around him. You can see his little ball on the ground behind him and his scratching post behind that. But we can zoom in and actually take real world measurements. In a moment, I'm going to measure his ear to ear distance. I mean, maybe, maybe we didn't know what he was, but oh, he's got 10 centimeter ear distance. He's probably a domestic house cat. And uh, we'll measure the nose to tail here a second, but uh, you can see you can actually do things like make measurements on an animal without tranquilizing them and capturing them and actually take these measurements in situ as they walk past with, without disturbing them. Since it's all infrared, there's no strobes. You don't even, the animal doesn't even know it went off as they went by. And my cat had a treat, so he didn't care anyways. But <laughs> so well, that's all we have. And uh, I think going forward, uh, we hope to keep developing these technologies as well as others to really show people their world in a new light and help convince them that it's worth protecting. So thank you. Thank you.